Jackie. Says it's preparing to live stream, but it always goes live right away. Hello. 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 Hi, OAC. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Karen Boyty, and I am part of the Ontario Autism Coalition's Board of Directors. The OAC is a volunteer organization. Not to brag, but we are a relentless advocacy group for autism families in Ontario. We work together to ensure that publicly funded needs-based services for autistic individuals are accessible, ethical, evidence-based, and comprehensive. Right? Right, gang? Yeah, that yep. is us. correct. That's our mandate. So from time to time, we host Facebook Live uh, live discussion to help us all unpack the politics of autism and how it impacts you or your family. We also try to pull back the curtains and give you an opportunity to get to know some of our best advocates, i.e. these guys right here. And we hope that these lives provide information in manageable chunks. Tonight... We are going to discuss the media, i.e. the press and advocacy via social media. How do we keep our issues in the public arena? Who do we want to reach and why? As we hurdle towards a spring election, who do we need to convince to adopt a needs-based needs services for all in the province of Ontario? We'll also touch on how to avoid wasting time and your valuable energy on people who will never buy in. Alina Camera, ha, Cameron, hi Alina, and Adriana Atkins are two parents from Northern Ontario. Their families from the North have been putting us Southerners to shame on how well they brought attention to issues concerning education and the Ontario Autism Program. Angela, Bruce, Laura, bear with us. We'll come to you in a second, but let's start with uh, Alina and Adriana. Alina, tell us about Northern Autism Families Matter. Uh, well, Northern Autism Families Matter is a grassroots political autism advocacy group with a focus on providing knowledge to families, the community, and government on clinically needs-based services. Are yes, I read other, that off of our script. Are, are, there, <laughs> are there other parent groups in Northern Ontario that you're aware of? There are. There's another one just like us in Northeastern, like Northern, or Northern Autism Families is in Northwestern Ontario. Um, there's a really good group in Northeastern Ontario based out of the Sudbury area called Northern Ontario Autism Alliance. Mm -hmm. So they are, we are all connected, the OAC and OAA and NAF, and we often work on projects together and support each other and help amplify each other's voices when things are happening. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the reason why we decided to do this live uh, was actually Bruce's idea, and uh, he, um, he noticed that how successful Northern families were in getting several journalists to interview parents and cover autism stories up North. And so I wanna ask you, how the heck did you do that? How did you get such attention in your community? Oh, is that for me again? What, okay. Yeah, um, yeah. what'd you do, okay. Alina? How'd you get, <laughs> what'd you guys do? We were persistent. Um, it's persistence. It's making your list of, of media outlets and media contacts in your area and staying on top of that list. It takes time to grow that list. Um, it was something we worked on together as a group. Um, Adriana managed it. We got some help with some friends who were part of Thunder Bay Family Network on how to keep that list and what information to keep. Um, we also talked to people in the OAC about how they went about things, but you just build relationships really with those uh, reporters. And you, what you do is you, you kind of, you focus on the reporters that capture the story the way you want. So we have some reporters who really understand, like they get it, they're sympathetic to our cause, they understand where we're coming from. Some of them might have relatives who are on the spectrum and they care and we build relationships with them. And the nice thing is some of them will stick with you. Like some of them we've known for years and they just keep coming back for refresher stories, um, which is nice because they kind of have the whole arc, the whole story arc. 
and they know where we're at and they know where we've been and they bring that into their stories, which is nice. So, so it's, it's a, it's a progress a work in progress all the time. So besides putting a media list together, how did you make first contact? Did you write press releases? We did. We made a list and every time we were up to something, we would send out a press release. If there was something that the government announced that we didn't like, we'd put out a press release. If we were going to go stand and protest in a location because a certain politician was in town visiting, we would put out a press release telling them this is where we're going to be at this time and this is why and this is what we hope to accomplish. How many do you think you sent out on any given week? Oh, geez. The beginning was a lot. A yeah. Lot? yeah, yeah. Once a week, every, every, every well, week. when some, yeah, yeah, it was a lot. It was, we would have to send to every radio station, every news outlet, every, every newspaper, like everybody. But now we've kind of willed it down to, you know, you, you learn what media outlets tied to what company and that they talk to each other and you know one will pick it up and because one picks it up the other one picks it up and some now we kind of like point people we'll send it to point people and then it kind of gets fanned out further mm -hmm. it's interesting so how do you write a press release what what do you put inside each of your press releases adriana um, okay, so we would start off with, uh, obviously, the problem of what was happening with the Ontario Autism Program. Um, we would come up with why um, it wasn't appropriate and then what they could do to make it better. Um, we always brought solutions because it's kind of, um, you don't really get anywhere when you just complain. <laughs> you always mm -hmm. have to come up with something, otherwise there's no follow through and there's no accountability that way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I wonder if we could post some examples on our Facebook page for for parents to see. Uh, we have um, we have Lily. We have too. Lily. Yeah, and there are also examples of very good press releases on the OAC page. Uh, Lily is watching tonight. I wonder, Lily, if you would mind pulling a few that you like and posting them. Uh, Lily is one of our fantastic Facebook admins. Let me ask you a chicken and egg sort of question, Alina. So what comes first? Do you call the press or do you draw reporters attention to you with stunts and actions? Northern Autism Families always lets the press know that our stunts are coming so that they're there to witness the stunts. That's worked well for us. I don't know if we've ever tried it the other way. Um, we always let people know when we're going somewhere to do, like when we were going down to Queens Park, we kind of let people know that that was happening. Um, before we do a rally, we'll let them know where we're at. They'll show up with cameras in tow, take statements. We kind of prepare what we're going to say ahead of time. We kind of already have rehearsed. That's a nice thing about writing the press release is that it gives you a moment to sit down and get your thoughts straight as to what you're going to say to the media afterwards to support that press release. Um, and you all, and we all sit down together and like someone will draft it and we have a group chat and we'll drop it in our group chat and everyone will read it and, um, and give edits so that everyone's had a chance to look at it and everyone's got their key points down. And then our group is really spread out and we're not always available to be at all these stunts together. So sometimes whoever's at the event will do the event. And if there's follow-up media, the other members will jump in and take care of that. So it's helped that everyone's had a part in writing the press release because everyone's up to date on the key points that you'd want to make with that event. Mm -hmm. Do you assign a key spokesperson? Uh, it kind of changes. It's whoever's available. That's the nice thing about Northern Autism Families. We don't have like one leader. It's like, it's a small group of families and we every whoever's available will take that opportunity and if someone can't make it the next person steps up um yeah it's kind of nice that way we just we kind of share the podium and we take turns so oh last time you did this it's your turn now you're on the hot seat so everyone <laughs> everyone gets a turn at the mic so yeah <laughs> Adriana and Alina, uh, and don't worry, Bruce, I'll get to you, okay? Uh, Adriana, <laughs> you and Alina flew down to Toronto a few years ago before COVID hit and uh, bumped into somebody in the hallway at Queen's Park. Who, who was that? That was Doug Ford. It was Doug Ford. 
and that there's a, a very famous photograph which i would love to share but uh there's some people <laughs> in there that don't want their image shared uh but there's a lovely photograph of you staring down the premier with your hair beautifully done i must say oh, and uh alina standing yeah. beside you how did that come about what was that interaction like um so we were down in the cafeteria and honestly i don't think we were really expecting him to come down because he knew we were there and um waiting obviously and he um yeah he just came down and i pointed at alina and i said he's here and before i knew it i was on my feet uh, walking towards him and it was great because all of us kind of came in together and um yeah I, I words just started coming out everything that has i had in the back of my um sorry in the back of my head for the past two years was just screaming and i'm like how am i going to make this effective i said what i could in a few sentences and then before i know it i i got emotional um pretty emotional i i didn't quite know what to do think luckily bruce was there and i'll never forget the compassion that man had um and he got me through the rest of the day i have to say because <laughs> i was it, you know you, you you picture that moment and then he's finally there in your face giving you all the nonsense that he has said before um such repetitive and non-existent plans he's like well we've done this and we've done that I'm like, no you haven't and you're gonna and he says he knew everything about the north and he well doesn't i even know how, how thunder him. he doesn't well, he even doesn't know, know where we are that's true <laughs> she doesn't know what thunder Bay. so how'd she do bruce oh, oh she was amazing mm -hmm. absolutely amazing and this is one of the one of the most important things and, and Adriana talks about being emotional, but it's your emotion that gets the point across. Mm -hmm. But because you've thought about it beforehand, and as Alina says, you know, co collaborating on writing the news release, everybody knows what the points they want to make are. So when they're on the spot, they can do that. And the emotion comes through. And that is that is felt. So you're not just heard, you're felt. Mm -hmm. And that's what matters. Mm -hmm. And can I add, yes. at the end of that discussion, mm -hmm. Adriana had moved off because she was getting upset. A few other stragglers were behind. And at the end of the discussion, Doug Ford asked if we had a meeting arranged with MCCSS. And if we hadn't, I think he knows he had, a, we had a meeting set up, but he offered another one. He's like, if you didn't have a meeting set up, I would offer one to you now. So what was your impression? How, how did, how did he receive you guys, Alina? What was your impression of the premier? Um, I think he was sizing us up, you know, a couple moms from up in north the northwestern ontario from the boreal forest like you know he came he came he reminded us of the protest we had when he was in town called us ballistic um he said he didn't want to speak to us further because of what had happened supposedly at that protest but then he continued talking with us he kept talking he kept saying he's the boss and I'll tell them to do that. And I'm not in charge of that. I'm just the boss. He kept harping on that. Um, I, I, I'm not sure what the purpose of his visiting us was, but to be quite honest, I, I think it was just sizing up just to see who it was in Thunder Bay who was yelling at him, <laughs> to be yep. quite honest, but, <laughs> but we got what we wanted. We got a, we got a meeting with MCCSS and we got to see the man in person and tell him what we needed to tell him, which was that was good. Angela, can you tell us briefly what is the Oasis beef with the Ford government? Well, <laughs> so much. <laughs> there are so many things. Uh, let me start by saying the first thing they did was freeze the wait list uh, to access autism services in the fall of 2018. And they did it secretly and covertly. And they sent memos to um, 
the 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 regionals uh, because they are the ones that were managing all of the funding, telling um, them not to take children off of the wait list, and they and they were told not to tell parents. Now that is so underhanded. Like just to begin with that, that is horrific, and we didn't know that was happening. We found out much later, but then of course came February sixth of. Uh, 2019, right, when um, the lady of the hour, I don't know if I'm allowed to say her name, but uh, you know, the one who won't be named, he, he she who shall not be named, um, interestingly started off announcing that the Ontario Autism Program would be completely destroyed by saying that every child, and this is a common phrase, you know, we all say this in the community, if you've met one child with autism, you've met one child with autism or person with autism. Uh, because we're, they're so unique, right? People on the spectrum, it's a spectrum, they're unique. They uh, require individualized support. And that's how she started saying that she was going to destroy the Ontario Autism Program, and then proceeded to inform us that the plan is a one size fits all. So hypocrisy in the first 15 minutes, as soon as her mouth opens. Um, and then it just gets worse and worse from there. This government has made promises they've never met. They've uh, set deadlines for themselves that they've never met. Deadlines from internally, externally, they've never met them. We have so many beefs with this government. And then on top of that, when we went out as advocates for our children, the MPPs, they shut us down. They wouldn't listen to us. We really, really needed to make our voices heard. Um, and that's, that's a problem. When government isn't listening to the constituents, that's not a government. A Chris, I'm going to read a passage from a book called The Only Average Guy. I'm going to pull it up here for you. It's written by a Toronto City Councillor who watched both Rob and Doug Ford. Rob Ford was Doug's uh, brother. He's passed away now. He watched them cut their teeth, uh, their political teeth. And it's a compelling tale by a writer who really tried to understand the success of Toronto's Ford Nation years. The passage is, partisan brains seem disproportionately drawn to the Fords whose own brains are filled with the most partisan of thoughts. With the Fords, everything is so extreme. They will tell a lie and then they'll believe it. And then later the truth and all, and it will, uh, the truth and it always was the truth. There's a segment of the population just like that. There has always been a saying amongst critics of politicians that they believe their own news releases. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is easy and simple to fall into line, sometimes hook, line, and sinker, with an oversimplified version of reality and solutions. And that's what the Fords offer. They, you know, there was, there was a meeting shortly before that woman made the announcement that between the chief of staff, her chief of staff and Laura, um, and he said to her, you know, it doesn't matter what we do, you people are gonna protest anyway. It was intellectually lazy. There was no effort into actually coming up with a solution. And so when MPPs wouldn't meet with us, they'd already been primed. There was, a, there was an MPP briefing, a caucus briefing, that staff was excluded. And I'm sure that was because of me. Um, in October, the plans were already in place. But part of that was warning them that members of the OAC were professional protesters. We were just there to um, dump on them, to make them look bad. Well, that slowed us down probably by three months 
because we had to get over that and get through to individual members. It took a while. It was hard. But once they realized that they'd been sold a bill of goods about who we are, were and what we were about, that cognitive dissonance, in the end, it opened the door wider for us. Mm -hmm. They're true believers because it's easy. It's just, yeah. it's simple and easy. Yeah. You don't have to do I, any I, intellectual work, right? If you just, if you just believe, like when, Bruce and I both experienced this, when you, when you work inside government and all you spend your whole day with people who think like you, and then after work, you go out with people who think like you, and the only things that you read and consume in the media are from people who think like you. Talking points. Um, then The binder. Yeah, and that's that's the worst of it, is when you start to, to just have that single mindedness that doesn't allow other ideas to come into the picture. Mm -hmm. Another paragraph from the same book, the partisan brain, die hard Ford supporters are extreme examples of how it works. Once the partisan brain makes a decision, it, it's really hard to admit that the wrong decision, uh, that it's the wrong decision and change your behavior. There's a direct correlation with Ford Nationers and the people who are really, really immovable once they've made a decision. Mm -hmm. So what? So who are we up against then, guys? We're, with an election coming up. So I just want to. I'll go ahead. Say this. Sorry, I just want to say this. I when I was thinking this before. I wanted to say this one term that I learned. Um, about the description of mostly backbenchers, but a lot of the uh, PC MPPs, and I heard this from uh, actually Minnie Taylor, and that her, it's a very apt description and she refers to them as mushrooms. And the reason they're mushrooms is because they're kept in the dark and fed crap. A and, it, <laughs> and it's crap that they continue to consume and spew. And so that's accurate. who we're up against. Yeah. Yeah. And this, this whole problem of, and I mean, we see it so much in the news right now, the, the culture that we're living in is one that's really, really polarized. And the Ford supporters are living inside their own filter bubbles where their, their minds cannot take in information that contradicts what they've been told. We have to make sure as advocates that we don't fall into the, the flip side version of that same trap, right? Like I want everybody out there to not just be following the OAC, but also to be following the government. You need to see what they're saying. You need to think about it. And if something doesn't connect with what you've heard from the OAC, you need to ask questions. You know, if we if we go into our filter bubbles and we never communicate with anybody outside it, then we're just as bad as they are. So we've got to read what they're writing. We've got to look at the news outlets that they look at, even though for some of it's, it's like physically painful. I can, I can really only watch Fox News for about five minutes at a time, but I do it as an intellectual exercise um, because I need to know how other people are thinking. When you hear an idea that's, that's different, Ford supporters will just go, well, that's not true because it doesn't jive with, with what they've been thinking. But what I want to encourage our activists to do is when you hear something that's the opposite of, of what you believe, I want you to run towards that and ask questions and go, wait, how did you come to that conclusion? Why do you believe that? And so one of the best things that we do when we go in and we meet with MPPs is we say, look, we know what you've been told. You've been told X, Y, and Z. We're here to tell you actually that those things aren't true. And it, and it takes some convincing, but you have to... I guess before you even have to do that, the way you break down a true believer is you find out what you have in common. Um, so it could be, you know, we, we both like the same hockey team or we both know some of the same people or we're both from the same part of the province. You spend some time humanizing yourself with that person and breaking things down because it's a lot easier to, to, to push away somebody who's just yelling at you and being rude to you. But if somebody comes in and says, hey, here's some timbits. I'm so glad you took the time to meet with us. Hey, so I see you've got a, you know, a Leafs jersey there. Okay, cool. I went to, you break that down and, 
and it's surprising actually in as we were meeting with MPPs in 2019 and, and uh, 2020, it's surprising how many of them really came over quietly and with great fear came over to our side and helped us um, in some back rooms that that where their actions never got seen. Mm -hmm. We'll be able to tell stories someday. Isn't Doug Ford a master of that? Bringing in the coffee and the Tims or maybe yeah. a, snow a snow shovel? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. He, he sits you down at your at his desk and gets a picture of you. Mm -hmm. He's done it with the Durham crew. He's done it with the implementation committee. It's 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 masterful. Ah, that little this, shovel reminds, there, right? this reminds <laughs> me. If you if the, you scroll, the difference is, yes. so I was just going to say, the difference is when we go in, we mean it. We're passionate. Mm. Yeah. When he does it, it's very obviously disingenuous. Yeah, yeah. he's it, showing it, off. It, he's trying to mm -hmm. impress people. And I think actually, if we go back to why he went down to the cafeteria, a lot of politicians like Doug Ford know that they can impress people, right? So, oh, you get to meet the big guy or you get to sit in Doug Ford's chair or, you know, I'm going to give you my personal cell phone number, right? And so they try to impress people and, and, and sort of buy them off with the trappings of power. You know, I'll, I'll give you a ticket to, to the speech from the throne or I'll, I'll give you a gallery pass. Yeah. <laughs> Here, here's a I sat beside Charles McVetty and he's now a third party advertiser. Here's, here's, a, here's a tidbit for the, for the newbies. If you scroll through the, face, the Facebook page and look for pictures of say the Durham crew who managed mm -hmm. to get meetings with everybody, look at the pictures of them with the politician. They mm -hmm. never smile. Yeah, they're so they good. They never smile. They put on that disappointed look on their faces and they never give the politician the opportunity for that photo op. It's awesome. I love yeah. that. Uh, here's a question for any of you. So we, this, our story or the, sto the story of the uh, Ontario Autism Program being blown to smithereens has been covered a lot. Uh, however, the, the, the press seems to follow whatever the soundbite of the province is, and they're very good at feeding what seems to be a good news story, mm -hmm. and the public seems to think that the issue is over, that we got what we wanted. H how do we... How do we respond to that? How do we teach the public that this is not the case? Alina, what, what do you do? We keep reminding them. We keep going back to our media list and reminding them that we're still here, that our children are still waiting, that there's more children than ever still waiting, and that the band-aids that the government is trying to sell as fixes are very limited and this, their scope is very small. Um, and it requires us all to be involved. And thank you for putting this up. This yeah, is the, the action this. checklist. <laughs> so what's on here? This is only part of it. It's, uh, I couldn't get the, the whole image on, on the screen. Well, yeah, what's on here that um, people can use? It's just a really quick guide on some things we can do right away to get involved. So um, it has links to all of the OAC social media. Um, it has a link to the OAC website where there's a lot of really good resources. You can find out more about who the board of directors are. There's a media kit in there. There's information on upcoming events. There's, there's, all, like, there's a ton of resources there. Go check it out, it's really good. Um, further down in the list, there's um, how to find your writing and therefore how to find your MPP, how to contact your MPP, how to go about that. It's got a link to the media kit there. There's also um, a list of emails that a lot of people are using right now to write into the, the Ministry of Children, Community, and Social Services that's responsible for the Ontario Autism Plan. Um, and letting them know their story because we've heard from bureaucrats that they aren't hearing from families. So there's just assuming that everything is fine and everyone's happy with what they're doing. So it is really, 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 really important that everyone write in, write in, make sure you tag the Oasis Tony Stravato for a little accountability. Um, because we don't want to hear them saying that anymore, that they're not hearing from us and that they're assuming everything is fine. 
we know they're getting the emails. They've been complaining about the emails. <laughs> they're Angela, getting them. you look like you wanted. Yeah. You look like you wanted to add to that, Angela. I, I just wanted to say that's a very, very good point because every meeting I've had with either the bureaucrats or the ministry staffers, I'm telling them information about what's happening on the ground, and their response to me is almost always, "Oh, we never heard that." So <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I heard that. That's the benefit of copying Tony. Mm -hmm. That's yes. it, it, Accountability. It, it's almost it's almost more important than telling your own story mm -hmm. because it gives people like Angela backup. Mm -hmm. She's going in there fighting for you. Mm -hmm. So if you let her know through Tony that you send an email and two or three or four hundred hundred other people do the same. When they say that, Angela gets to say, I know that you've actually gotten 400 of these. Mm -hmm. Well, now you can't say that anymore. And in the <laughs> middle of the meeting, that's a grand clong. That's a huge deal. Yeah. And also, also on that page is to tell some friends about it. We don't mean friends in the know. Go outside of your usual circle tell people, tell five, five people, five people that don't know anything about the, the OAP and think that everything is fine. Tell them, tell them your family's story. Tell them the stories you read on the OAC Facebook page. Tell them what's happening. Um, I think the more people read about this, the more they'll realize that this is the current government's MO with a lot of issues mm -hmm. and that we are all united under this. Um, especially in light of the pandemic, we've seen this this method of operation several several iterations of it, you know, being put forward in in onto the population, and everyone's kind of upset. And I think we're all kind of united in that. So let's um we can all boost each other's voices by by sharing our stories that way. Let's circle back around to talking to the press, Angela. What keeps journalists coming back? to you, president of the OAC, or Laura, or Alina, or Bruce, or Adriano, what keeps them coming back? You know, it's funny, I just uh, spoke to Sine Dugal today. Um, first, it's to be extremely accessible. That's, that's important. Um, I think the key is really to be knowledgeable about what's going on. You have to keep up with what's happening. Um, making sure that you know what, you know, what the ministry is doing. Um, I think, honestly, the key is to be passionate. It's to um, talk about the children and say, this is, this is not about money. This is not about, this is not numbers. This is affecting the lives of children in the province. This is affecting their future. Right, And I think that journalists understand that, they feel it, they can feel the passion, they can feel um, our, our love. Honestly, it's really about our love for all of the, the children that have been, um, you know, their, their development has been really stymied as a result of what this government has done. And when I speak to the media, I am not shy about how brokenhearted I am for the community. And I think they can all respect that. They can respect a parent fighting for their child. And even further, they can respect an advocate fighting for a community that is marginalized. And honestly, what the government has done really feels malicious. And if you make that point uh, very easy to understand, um, then they want to speak to you. They want to follow you. The one thing that you have to avoid, and it's I have trouble with that sometimes because you know I'm a numbers person, um, is to get too far into the details. That's when you lose them. So keep things very high level and and talk about the children. And they really want to be um, uh, involved in that because a lot of the journalists are parents themselves. Mm -hmm. Adriana, add on to that? What does it feel like, Adriana, to expose so much of your life, like the most vulnerable part of yourself, which is your kid? What yeah, is that I'm, like? I, I never thought um, I'd ever have to do that. 
I don't, I don't feel embarrassed, but I do feel embarrassed for the government when I'm speaking. It's kind of like, how can this be? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you get that reaction from the reporters or the the journalists as well. They, they get really in tuned in your story. They feel, I feel like they're invested. And uh, sometimes that even makes it, it kind of harder because they try to come to your level, right? Um, They sympathize and they, they can, they can see for what it is. They follow the media as well, right? So then when they hear the story about how it's affecting someone, um, especially someone as, you know, as young as our children, um, it, it, it touches them and um, it, 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 it's hard, but uh, it, Can I add on to that, Karen? it's raw, right? Please. Yeah. Laura. The, the other thing I think that's really key in developing relationship. Well, it's, it's about developing relationships with reporters um, and you do that by building trust. So if they share something with you in confidence, you don't, tell anyone else um, you know if if they come to you and say can you help me find a parent that fits this model then you're able to come through and say yeah I've got a parent for you in northern Ontario who's directly affected by that dependability you, yeah you become a yeah. dependable partner and and you become somebody who who has an understanding of the job of a journalist you have to be able to look not just at your own situation but you have to understand these people are working on a deadline um that they've got editors that they've they've got to be responsible to um but once you build those relationships you see the fruits of your labor in that and i i will never forget sitting in the in the press gallery with the um with the 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 press conference that todd smith and jeremy roberts did um and listening to the questions that the reporters asked Um, And realizing that those questions were so good because of the investments that we had put into those relationships. And so when Colin DeMello from CTV asked Jeremy Roberts, well, what's $5,000 really going to do for a kid with severe autism? Not only was it the perfect question. Um, but it backed Roberts into a complete corner and eventually they, they left the press conference because they, they couldn't defend what was, what was going on. So it's, it's about building those relationships and, and building trust. Um, and can I just say that my favorite part of the whole Northern Ontario families coming down when Alina and Adriana came to, to Queen's Park, I had lots of favorite parts, but my personal favorite part was when I found out that Adriana had a brain crush on, um, help, Cynthia Mulligan. Cynthia Mulligan. Thank you. Oh, yes, out of my head. Better. I hate when that happens. So I found, that's why she, I'm here. I found out she had a brain crush on Cynthia Mulligan. And I was like, I have a really good relationship with Cynthia Mulligan. I was like, you have to come and meet this mom. And then I just put the two of them together and I walked away and it was, it was super fun. Booyah. So, you know, when you, when you have a relationship like that with a journalist, then you know they're going to call you up and you know we know like clockwork when april hits and it's autism awareness month our phone is going to start to ring and and they know that we will be ready with good content for them to share with their readers their viewers and their listeners yeah alina alina wanted to add something yeah alina i'm gonna add something Mm -hmm. absolutely Alina? Um, yeah, one other thing I just thought of, of when it comes to building the relationship with, uh, with the reporters and media is that when you're writing your press releases and you're including like links and references in them, yeah. shoot those over to the reporter because quite often mm-hmm. they're looking for that information as like receipts for what you're saying and what you're arguing. Right. And um, Always bring receipts. Bring Always. the receipts. Send them the link. Say, hey, we're talking about X, Y, Z. Here's all the links to the media releases from the government. Here's the link to our press release. Uh, You know, here's the numbers. Like, I know for the last one we did with the with the reporter from CBC, I was sending him clips like right out of documents from the government, and he was very thankful for that. So help them with the homework. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Angela, Angela, you wanted to ask. I I was going to say something along the same vein. um, The same vein. Uh, Laura mentioned, you know, understanding what um, reporters do or journalists do. And that's something that I've done um, over the last few years is I have sent like completely, um, you know, unsolicited, I send them information as things are changing. And that's how I ended up establishing relationships. Well, first you have to get their cell phone so you can text them. 
<laughs> but every so often, every so often I would text like Colin DeMello, Cynthia Mulligan, other other reporters, you know, from um, Canadian press or whatever, um, saying, did you know that this happened? And nine times out of 10, they text me back saying, thank you, I didn't know this was happening. And maybe within a few days, they'll call me back. Mm -hmm. So it's just sharing information with them, not always expecting a response. Just saying right. this is what's this is what went down, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, because they, they don't always know, and they often appreciate getting that information. They really and do. it gives them more time to write a bomb piece because you did all the homework for them. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Let's let's talk about social media with our last fifteen minutes. Bruce, help me out here. Uh, Twitter just looks like a bathroom wall to me, but then one day <laughs> you schooled me. <laughs> Tell us about what OAC insiders refer to as the pork roast. And <laughs> yes, <laughs> well, that woman whose name I cannot say. Um, Lisa McLeod, Lisa McLeod, oh. Lisa McLeod, Lisa McLeod, Lisa McLeod. For his blood pressure. Don't I know. See? He gets He'll cramps. be okay. He'll I be get right. cramps. I know. <laughs> There's always a new parent watching these lives okay, who doesn't okay, know what we're okay. talking oh, about. Right? Oh, they are. It hurts me so much. Lucky. So <laughs> she had a terrible tendency to hire failed candidates as her uh, as her policy assistants she had uh who was that federal woman that was her oh i can't even yeah, remember her uh, name the mind blots a traumatic experience but anyway <laughs> um, worth remembering. she had one guy um named bill hogg who was a particularly um nasty mm -hmm. person and he was dispatched as the minder over the, uh, the advisory committee that Laura sat on, um, regularly reined them in to doing, from doing the things that they wanted to do, uh, worked in close collusion with the assistant deputy minister who had also had responsibility within the bureaucracy. They were just nasty people. That's Jennifer and, Morris, by the way, so everybody yes, knows. Yes, Jennifer Morris, who is on the email list send her your love. Um, so <laughs> Bill, um, Bill was supposed to go when we managed to get that woman demoted. Um, you might recall she was kicked out of MCCSS down to uh, sport and tourism. 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 Yeah. <laughs> well, big demotion. Um, big, big demotion. And we also, at the same time, managed to knock off her chief of staff, Tim Porter, who was also another sociopath. But sadly, Mr. Hogg got to stay on with uh, Todd Smith, the new minister. And this was just absolutely unacceptable. If you're really committed to changing the previous minister's policy, don't keep her policy assistant. Well, they did. <laughs> <laughs> and we were after them in meetings. We were after them in email. Laura was talking to the chief of staff on a regular basis that this ain't cool. Well, finally, we had enough. And Laura unleashed the hounds, and I will never forget it. She just said, fine, go after this guy. Do it on social media. Go after him on Twitter and let him have it. We did. Boy, did we ever. And you know what? We got him. We got him. They canned him. I got a call from the minister's office. Well, sort of the minister's office. Good old Jeremy Roberts to tell me that it would have been so much simpler if you people hadn't been so nasty about it. Well, yeah, being nice about it hadn't worked, Jeremy. But anyway, his desk was empty. He was gone. Thank you. I got a row up here you know we got a minister under the liberals this time we got a minister a chief of staff and a policy assistant i feel like a hunting lodge <laughs> i have a quick bill hogg story uh laura will recall this we were brought out to a meeting with the ministry before you became president angela and uh we went into one of those big 
boardroom Ooh, type things, yeah. right? Uh, and it was four mothers with our cloth winter coats and Cheerios in our pockets <laughs> going <laughs> into this huge room. And, uh, and there was a, a line across the room of children's drawings oh God, by yeah. young Whoa. children. And they looked at us and they went, huh? 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 Hey? <laughs> See, we care about kids. No, we care don't. about kids. Angela, didn't Captain Kirk get in the action on, on Twitter and battle with some of our moms and dads? Yeah, he blocked me. <laughs> <laughs> what happened there? <laughs> what happened with Captain Kirk? <laughs> um, well, you know, he's, he's an old man. Um, I think he's a little bit senile. So, <laughs> although, you know, I was, I've always been a fan. So, you know, it was really disappointing to be completely honest. Um, it was a, it was a bell, uh, let's talk actually. And the PC government was uh, pushing that bell, let's talk day. And I was writing and, and Captain Kirk was supporting it. We're talking about, of course, uh, William Shatner. Um, as he, you know, likes to refer to himself as Bill, it's another Bill. Um, he, you know, he's, he didn't want to hear it. He didn't want to hear it. He's like, uh, like, like, let's not taint the day. And I'm like, you don't understand this government uh, destroyed funding for children with autism. And now they're feigning that they care about uh, mental health. Like we can't, we cannot support that. This government has caused um, a mental health crisis. And now they're going to like, it's the same thing as the drawings. It's so disingenuous. Like, yeah. look at me, look, I care. Oh my goodness, I have a friend with autism. Therefore, I am, you know, a saint. And uh, you know, that's, that's what it was with him. It, it wasn't a big deal. Honestly, but, uh, what but, about but our profile? I, I did get blocked and I was. Yeah. <laughs> Poor Angel. But what about our Alina? Uh, a debate with a star? Is that good for the pro our profile? Does it matter? Does it? Eh? Okay, tell tell me about that trustee, school trustee in York Region. Oh, Liz, Liz Terrell, Elizabeth Terrell Tracy, AKA Swag Song. So we didn't know who Swag Song was for a very long time because obviously that's, you know, uh, what do you call those uh, accounts? Uh, a shadow burner. account, burner account, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, we always, were, we were taking guesses. We thought it was maybe that woman's husband for a while because like, we didn't know the gender of the person, right? Obviously. So there were all these theories as to who it was. Um, and then one day, she accidentally responded to a swag song tweet under her own Twitter account as Liz Terrell. And she got caught. And I think it was the Durham crew actually that caught it, somebody from the Durham crew, and they screen capped it. And this, that was so brilliant. And that's the thing we always have to remember. These people, these people, now I sound like Don Cherry. <laughs> Careful. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> um, but people no, people like that that geez, are geez. you know they're 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 malicious. That their intent is it's it's to hurt. Honestly, mm -hmm. Swag Song was attacking children, was attacking parents for no good reason. Calling parents uh, with autism, you know, as, like people who had their hand out looking for government money. They were just looking for money for babysitting. It was so hurtful, the comments that Swag Song was making, but people like this don't tend to be brilliant. Eventually, they will screw up, and we have to be there to catch them. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of the, the Durham crew, who was the MPP who pretended to be celebrating Christmas at home wearing the same outfit uh, while tweeting season's greetings from a beach in the Caribbean every day? Karate. Rod, that's uh, the, the, the former Minister of Finance, Rod Phillips, and recently resigned MPP from somewhere out in Durham. I forget the riding name. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's interesting. He's uh, he's decided not to run again and and to resign like effective immediately. So 
Um, see, yeah. Although I'll be interested to see whether he decides to take a run at, uh, at the federal leadership. But one of the things that's interesting no, 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 to look at right now, or or, prov or provincial. Well, we'll see. Um, but look at how many conservative MPPs are jumping ship. Um, can you take out the poster from from under there? Oh, not quickly. No. Anyways, we've got a poster of all of the conservative um, MPPs at, at Queen's Park. The tally's and, 15 at the moment. Yeah, there's 15 that have said they're not running again. So that's a pretty significant um, amount. Um, but Karen, can I loop back for a second to, uh, to what you were saying about Twitter? Yeah. Because I just I just want to warn the, the, the people that are watching all of this. Um, Twitter can be very combative. I, I think it's like Facebook is like your diary, right? You're like, hey, this is what's going on in my life. Instagram is like your photo album. Um, TikTok is where people go to show their their clown, their their goofiness, their weirdness. Um, Twitter is just mean. Twitter can be a very mean place. It doesn't have to be like that. Um, and I want to encourage people, you don't have to engage with every bully that you meet on Twitter. And in fact, it's not emotionally healthy for you to do so. Um, my rule is one, two, three, and block. I will try three times to engage with somebody and have a reasonable conversation with them. And if they're coming at me with nothing but verbal attacks and swearing and, and that kind of stuff, I will just block and, and move on. Um, that being said, it is an effective advocacy tool, particularly when you're tagging politicians. Yes. Um, oh my goodness, in 2019 and 2020, I had, I won't name them yet, um, but I had probably half a dozen MPPs calling me, begging me to, to call off our dogs on Twitter <laughs> because they were just so upset that so many autism parents were like, but, but my kid is suffering under this program and this program is awful. And they weren't tweeting mean or malicious things. They were, they were speaking their truth, but they were going well, some, after some their, were, but they were some, good. Some were, were meaner than, than others. Um, but Twitter is, is a powerful tool. And frankly, you got, it, it's like, they're afraid of it. It's like dynamite. You got to be careful. It works really well, but you got to be careful how you use it. Mm -hmm. um, and also, it doesn't have to just be dynamite. Twitter can also be a place to network um, and to to amplify other voices. So it's yeah. you know it's all in how you use it and who you follow. Um, so yeah, just proceed with caution with Twitter. I guess is the advice. Good advice. I so, second uh, that. Uh, <laughs> final. Uh, Last question. So Laura, how do you differentiate between someone who might be egging you on or has triggered you? Uh, mm -hmm. If you're a parent going through an awful lot or a self-advocate who's a vulnerable sort of person, mm -hmm. um, when do you pull back and, and when do you proceed? Well, I think, like I said, I, I, I try the, the one, two, three and, and blog system. So I will try three times to engage to genuinely engage with somebody. If they're tagging me on something on, on social media and saying, you know, is this what you really think? I'll, I'll try to defend my position. I'll try to, to use that tactic of like finding out what we have in, in common. You know, we both care about autism as a, as a social justice issue. We, you know, we have this in common, we have that in common. Um, but if all they're doing is coming at me with hate and name calling, um, you know, we got time for that. Um, I, I, I got important things to do. Um, I'm, I'm not done my advocacy work, but I don't have time to fight with Twitter warriors um, who are just, I mean, here's, here's an ugly truth about, about our community. None of us are mentally well, myself included. Um, and sometimes, it, <laughs> thanks, you don't have to agree that hard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but like none of us are, are really healthy. I mean, we've, we're living through a global pandemic. We're living through a time where there's been a wholesale destruction of the autism program. We're, we're living in isolation. None of us are well. And so I don't, I, I remind myself not to take things personally when people come at me on social media. It doesn't happen as much as it used to, but when I was president, I got a lot of stuff. Um, but not taking it personally. Yeah, I got called a twat waffle. I had to look that up. Do not look that up. 
No, do not. Don't look that nice. up. Nice. No, no. Oh, awesome. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, that was that was my crowning achievement. And by that point, I developed skin that was thick enough that I burst out laughing. So whoever it was that called me that, like, thanks, you made my day. It was. It, I yeah. um, but you know, you have to you have to understand that some people can't be reasoned with because they're in too much pain at this moment. Um, and, you know, we have to meet all of our members where they're at, right? Some members are like, okay, my kid isn't getting what they need. I'm suffering. I'm hurting. I'm in pain. I'm reaching out for help. Some are not reaching out for help. They're reaching out to hurt and, and to deflect that pain. Um, some are reaching out just to know that they're not alone. You have to figure out where they are and meet them where they're at. But if they're coming from a place of just I'm not well and I'm angry and I'm hurting and I'm going to take everybody down with me. That's where you go. Sorry, sweetie. No, I'm not going with you. I, I, I got work to do. Mm -hmm. Angela, you wanted to add something before we wind down? Yeah, it was just something similar to what Lara, uh, Laura, Laura was saying. Um, and that's, you know, I, I haven't been called any great names. Uh, I haven't been really attacked that much, to be completely honest. Maybe it's coming. I don't know. Um, but I, <laughs> but I have had, you know, some tweets and my response has always been to reach out my hand and mm -hmm. say, if you need help, I'm here. I mm -hmm. often private message them and say, if you want to talk, you can message me anytime. Mm -hmm. I'm here. My DMs are open. Uh, I will talk about any issue that you have uh, a concern about. And if they don't respond, I let it go. And I assume that they're not in a place that they can talk or they want to talk. But if they do respond, then I will continue that conversation. And that's that's how I decide whether to let it go or keep going. Uh, it's it's never to turn my back. It's always to offer a hand and see maybe I can help. Maybe they don't want my help, but I'm going to offer it anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, Before, Karen, mm -hmm. just just to follow on that kindness mm -hmm. is always the route to go and unless it's bill hogg unless it's bill hogg but he had coming, baby. no there was one person when i was president who was an absolute jerk to me on twitter repeatedly and well karen i think you'll remember who it was and and it mm -hmm. was partly your advice that got me around but I just stopped arguing back because as a wise man once said to me, some people never get the joke. They're never going to hear what they don't want to hear. So I invited him over for dinner. I gave him my address and my phone number. And he didn't know how to deal. Now what? Yeah. And you know what? It stopped. Yeah. It stopped cold. I couldn't believe my luck. Yeah. But, but, you know. He never did come for dinner. He never did. He never disclaimer. Did. And disclaimer, I, I put a mean state. Disclaimer, please do not share your address on social media. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Things men That's can do that women can't. Yeah, don't yeah. don't take right. that advice from Bruce. The kindness, yes. Giving out addresses, kindness, no. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think we all agree there. So we, before we say good night, we want to leave you with an assignment, should you wish to accept it, OAC. Here are three easy things that you can do to get involved right away with the OAC. Alina, would you like to, to take over from here? Sure, I have I have not seen these slides. I don't know where oh. we're going with this. This is exciting. All right. Okay. <laughs> we see Facebook posts and Instagram posts. Um, add your perspective. Make sure that friends and family understand your situation. We talked about that, talking to five people about what's going on in your life. What's on the next slide? I like this. Uh, connect with people in your community. The OAC can hook you up. Come on, join the OAC. Read our resources meet some people. It's a good place. Working with a partner or a team will keep you going. Are you looking for volunteer opportunities? Check out the link. It's on the website, right, Bruce? There's a volunteer yep. link on the OAC website. Click that, fill the thing out. We'll be in touch shortly. Or you can message any admin on Facebook. Yeah, yep. or yeah, anyone. 
Think of ways to get attention and contact your local press. Connect with us for support, and vice versa. Make a list of all local media outlets in your area, including TV, radio, daily newspapers, Metroland papers, community papers, ethnic media, the works, university radio, they're really good too. Send yeah. it to media.list.ontarioautismcoalition.com. If they uh, email media list at ontarioautismcoalition.com, where does that email go to, Bruce? Uh, it comes in centrally. There's a team of us that watch it, and it'll be added to our central media list. Hang on to the list in your area because, you know, as we've been discussing, the whole purpose of this was to help you to become a spokesman on the issue. But it'll also give us the ability centrally to back you up. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's an hour. We gave you an awful lot of information. Thank you so much, OAC, for joining us. Angela Brandt, president of the OAC. Bruce and Laura, former presidents. Alina is our research specialist and epidemiologist, by the way. She's been very handy lately. And of course, Adriana, our Ford expert. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with our community. We hope that you found this helpful. A Adriana, do you have any final words for the night? Start your media releases. <laughs> yes, that's good advice. Start, we gave you a checklist. There's so many things that you guys can start doing in your pajamas, in your home. You know, you don't have to leave your house to be a great advocate. Um, that's how we started. I lived in a small town of a thousand people. You, anybody can do this. Do it for your kid. Hey, if we can do it, anybody can do it, right? And don't, worry, and don't worry if you can't, if you don't feel you can do too much, do what you can. What's our motto? Do, do what you what can, you can when, you when you can. When you can. Yes, do what you can when you can. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much. Good night, Bye. Bye. Don't give up. Don't give up. Good night.